Snake is back. Now, I am still talking about Amazon Lily, so the snake is still applicable. But it's a rattlesnake. That does not rattle. And as much as I like it, uh, it's not quite appropriate for this video. This, however, is slightly more appropriate considering it is a boa. And I'm going to be talking about Boa Hancock, current empress of Amazon Lily and captain of the Kuja Pirates, former warlord of the sea, um, one of the most wanted women in the world, probably one of the women with the highest bounty as well, given her current bounty, <clears throat> most beautiful woman in the world, pirate empress, snake princess, insert whatever else you want to give her for titles. Uh, B-I-T-C-H is also an applicable title depending on who you are. Woman who kicks small animals that are adorable. Again, also applicable. I'm not going to wear this the entire video because it will drive me insane. Brenda, do you want a boa? Do you want a boa? You want a pretty boa? Make Brenda pretty. She is like, um... What is this, and why is it on me? <laughs> okay, no boa on the Brenda. Got it. There we go. No boa for the Brenda. I also pulled out a heart scarf. That could have also been very applicable for this as well. Brenda, want this instead? Pretty Brenda. See, pretty Brenda. Do you get that pretty scarf? Uh, in honesty, I was debating about dressing up a bit for this video, since I have a couple of dresses, um, and, you know, this is Hancock and everything, and she is, you know, one of the, you know, considered one of the best girls in One Piece and everything like that. Um, if that's what you want, that's what you want, but I decided against it because none of the dresses quite looked good on camera. For me to want to wear for an hour a half hour ish 45 minute whatever video so no on that hi i have to record i'm gonna talk about a snake lady her why would you do that um so as i stated i am going to be talking about boa hancock um Although there was a little bit of news that I saw last night, the night before I recorded this, that made me very happy. And I was like, this will make Hancock very happy as well. They are going to have, uh, finally, there is going to be a One Piece balloon in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And it's going to be Luffy. It's a, a post-time skip Luffy, straw hat and all. And it looks adorable. And Toei made the announcement the other day, and I thought that was so cute. And I'm like, okay, well, that would be something Boa would be exceedingly happy about. Because it would be a giant version of Luffy, and it's literally made of a form of rubber. And it's going to be flying through the sky, and it's going to be ballooned. So there's a lot of One Piece references within that concept already. And yes, I am aware that it is not the first anime thing to be in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Pikachu has been there for years, so has whatever variation Super Saiyan form of Goku, I believe, has been there as well. For some reason, I think there's been something else in there that's been um, anime related as well, but I don't remember. But I'm just really happy that One Piece is going to be represented um, in that way. Um, but actually going into Boa Hancock, so as I stated, she is the pirate empress, warlord of the sea, most beautiful woman in the world, um, captain of the Kuja pirates, empress of Amazon Lily, snake princess, however many other titles you want to give her. And, uh, in regards to basic information, she is 31 years old, currently in the story. Um, her personal snake is, uh, I believe his name is Salome. 
Um, and <clears throat> her devil fruit power is, of course, the Maromero no Mi. Um, the love, love fruit, which allows her to, of course, turn people to stone that seem to form some, seem to show some form of, like, affection or adoration or something along those lines for her. It's mostly depicted as love, but I believe o Oda has also stated that it can also be affected by people who show a huge amount of respect for her um, and things like that because we've seen the the seraphim, the S snake, demonstrate similar powers um, or demonstrate the same powers, but more it's because people think she's cute or because people think, you know, whatever variation of that and that's what affects them. Um, <clears throat> I actually have made a bead version of the Maromara no Mi because we finally seen what it looks like. Um, I just didn't bring it up here with me because I forgot about it. Hi Brenda, are you going to go lay down? I pet you. Um, and in regards to her name origin because so many of the different um, uh, you know, the different Kuja tribe members and the Amazons of the Amazon Lily, their names all seem to be some form of an adaptation of a type of flower or a type of plant, mostly flowers. Um, marigold, different, you know, sweet pea, things like that. And of course, her sisters. But um, Hancock um, might be an alternative name for the um, Chenuit. Uh, coralberry, which is a species of snowberry, which I didn't know. Um, just like, okay, I'm going to look this up. Okay, I don't know what that means, but whatever, it's a type of plant. Um, you know, and we see that on Amazon Lily that so many of the different, you know, the, the women of Amazon Lily are all named after different types of plants. Gloriosa is, of course, named after a type of flower, as I went over with her video. And, of course, Shaki. Um, Shakuyaku is another form for the, a name for a type of peony. So, that works. Um, in regards to some basic history, um, her first bounty that she gained was 80 million berries. And when she became a warlord, which she, for the longest time, was the youngest warlord before law came along. Um, and she held that title for quite some time. Um... That was where her bounty was frozen, was at 80 mil, excuse me, was at 80 million. Currently, because the warlord system has been abolished, <clears throat> they have upped all of the former warlord's bounties. Obviously, we saw that with the cross guild with Mihawk and Crocodile and Buggy and everything and all of that. Uh, and with Weevil, but uh, with Hancock, it bumped up to 1 billion six. 659 million which I know there's a joke in there somewhere because Oda always does like joke puns with the numbers but I don't know what it is um so um I have stated in previous videos that when it comes to Boa Hancock she is not necessarily my favorite character I have stated why and I will state that again now but that does not mean that I do not like her to some degree there are certain aspects of her personality that I do like, but the part of her personality that she shows to the world, which is very much defied or defined by the the statement that she gives to uh, Momonga during, I think it's during their first interaction when we're introduced to her, and that is, whether I kick a kitten, tear off your ears, even slaughter innocent people, the world will never cease to forgive my actions. Why, you ask? That's right. It is because I am beautiful. And I'm not denying the fact that Boa Hancock is beautiful. Out of the three Boa sisters, between her, Sandersonia, and Marigold, my favorite is Sandersonia. Um, I just like her, and <laughs> I don't know why. I just like her, and she's much less um, arrogant than Boa is. But, and I also have stated this before in previous videos, Boa's arrogance is something that she uses as a type of armor. She uses her arrogance and her beauty as a type of armor to be able to protect her, her sisters, and her people from the outside world. Because, of course, her and her sisters experienced what was literally the worst type of 
you know, the worst experience that most people can go through when they became slaves, when they were kidnapped as children and became slaves. And that quote, the, the other quote that I have that is very much a defining thing of like the other side of Hancock is that even if it means deceiving my people, I have to continue to uh, have to continue the pre pretense. I don't want anyone to control me again. And this is what she says to Luffy at one point. I don't remember if this is after she's revealed, you know, the, the mark on her back, the hoof of the dragon, or if it's uh, some point when her and Luffy are talking. Um, but I think it's after she's revealed the mark, the hoof of the dragon on her back to him. Um, and those are two quotes that very much define Boa Hancock. She does not want to be perceived as weak or as a target for the world government because she's already seen what the people at the top of the world government are capable of. And she does not want to be seen as weak by her people, by the Kuja. And in all honesty, I think if the Kuja did find out about what actually happened to the Boa sisters during the time frame when they were gone, I don't necessarily think that the Kuja would see them as weak. They survived and they made it back home and they took the devil fruits that were forced upon them, the powers that were forced upon them from the celestial dragons and turned that into their own power. They took control of that power and now they use that power in order to defend their people. They took something that was deemed as they took the devil fruit powers that were forced upon them, the two heavy, heavy nomis and the Maramara nomi that were forced upon them by the celestial dragons. And they took that and they made it their own. And, you know, they, they came out stronger on the other side from what they went through. It does not lessen the pain of what they went through. And that is something that I never tried to make. I never tried to make that seem like my thought when it comes to Boa. I know lots of people who have been through horrible things in their lives that have been through various types of abusive relationships and I have seen them where they come out where it takes time for them to get back on their feet and that's always something that has been depicted when it comes to different types of um, media as well movies TV books stuff like that songs where people go through these horrible experiences and they try to come out stronger on the other side. Sometimes it takes a while for them to be able to get to the point where they are stronger after everything they've been through, but sometimes they do eventually get there. And sometimes it takes wearing a type of armor in order to do that. We see Nami do something very similar throughout the course of the East Blue, where she wears this armor and we saw this depicted to a degree rather well in the live action where she keeps you know technically to a degree lying to Luffy and Zoro and you know Usopp and everything for what happens to them but we also see these moments where she kind of opens up to Kaya and this moment where she opens up to Zoro a bit and then there is finally the moment where her armor this you know cloak of lies that she's been wearing cracks and then shatters and she finally asks Luffy for help, and then that's where they go and they fight Arlong. And that is what frees, you know, frees Nami in that regard. You know, Robin went through something very similar when it came to everything that was going on with the world government and Cypher Pole 9 and everything like that. So it's not like Hancock's story is completely new. Koala went through something exceedingly similar when we found out about her backstory, when we got the Fisher Tiger backstory and then met her again. Um, at, uh, you know, at Dressrosa. So that concept of like these, these former slaves that have made it through to the other side and, you know, gotten stronger is something exceedingly amazing. And we see the same thing portrayed when it comes to Fisher Tiger and with other um, former slaves of the Celestial Dragons that were the Fishmen that became members of you know, the Sun Pirates. Um, so we see that a lot throughout the course of the series. And sometimes it's not always people who were slaves of the Celestial Dragons, it's people who were in other horrible situations like Nami or Robin or even Vivi and Rebecca when it comes to Dressrosa and the people of Dressrosa as a whole for how, you know, Doflamingo ruled his kingdom. 
And those people made it out on the other side stronger. And they proved that by fighting back against Do Flamingo. Boa and her, or Hancock and her sisters proved that they made it through and became stronger through all the experiences that they went through. It may have took them a short bit of time to slowly to like rally and be able to return home, but they still got stronger on the other side and they survived and it didn't break them entirely. Which, you know, I have stated before, and I will continue to state, Boa is not, or Hancock is not my favorite character in One Piece, by a long shot. There's lots of other characters that rank higher than her. Lots of other female characters that rank higher than her. That does not mean I think she is a bad character. That does not mean she is not complex and not well designed by Oda. It just means that for the way that she acts, I do not care for it for the most part. Um, and some of that will be addressed as I go through the video. Um, but in regards to Hancock's story, in regards to this, her backstory and, you know, everything that goes on with her sisters. So Hancock was born 31 years ago, um, probably during the reign of whoever the previous empress was. Um, because Shaki would have already retired by that point in time and left, and Gloriosa would have left before that anyway. Um, if going over my, uh, you know, Amazon Lily timeline chart that I made. Um, but they were, you know, she was born on Amazon Lily, and then several years later, Sandra Sony, I believe, was born, and then Marigold was born. Um, and then 24 years ago is when she and her sisters were. Um, you know, when they heard about the death of Gold Roger and everything and the beginning of the Great Age of Pirates and they're like, oh, to be a strong pirate, you must be this and you must be that and everything. And we see that with them as children. And then 12 years before the story starts, before the beginning or before the current story, <clears throat> uh, Hancock and her sisters are off on, I think it's supposed to be like their first uh, excursion with the Kucha pirates when they are still children and not quite rookie pirates but like you know learning how to be pirates and everything and unfortunately what happens is they are suddenly captured by slavers taken to an auction house and then end up getting sold to the world government to the tenry Ubito, where they are then taken to marie joie and they are branded with the hoof of the dragon on their back and then for the next um, I believe it's three years that they are up there. They are just put through horrific, you know, the greatest horrors that are unimaginable. Um, and certain things that, well, Oda has hinted at in the story, he can't directly go over when it comes to certain things that were done with them, given the fact that they were, you know, all three of them were very beautiful girls that were captured. Um, during this time frame, Boa was force-fed the Meromeronomi, and her sisters were each force-fed a different version of the Heavy Heavy Nomi. Um, Marigold, I believe, got the Cobra, and uh, Sandersonia, I believe, got the, um, uh, I think it's the Python. Is it the Python, or is it the Boa, literally? I don't remember. Um, but they're both force fed a different variation of a snake snake fruit. <sighs> then three years after their suffering is when Fisher Tiger shows up and he causes this huge raid on Marie Joie, which given the fact that we have now learned about the God's Knights just heightens how badass Fisher Tiger was um, in the fact of what he was able to accomplish with, you know, getting all of these slaves freed and everything like that and allowing them to escape Marie Joie and the amount of damage he would have done to um, the Celestial Dragon City, which just heightens that given, you know, what we know about the God's Knights and everything. <clears throat> just ups Fisher Tiger's badassness, uh, badassery. Um, and they, the three sisters, the Boa sisters, are the one, are some of the slaves that manage to escape. You know, Koala is also one of these slaves. There's other slaves that are able to escape during that time frame as well. The three sisters end up making their way down the red line somehow. 
And from what I remember, from what I understand, they ended up somehow like hidden in the red line for a certain amount of time where they are eventually found by Gloriosa, so Rayleigh, and Shaki. The three of them then take the girls in and they they help them. They they raise them, they take care of them, they give them, you know, food and a place to live and clothes and someone to, that will listen to them and will hopefully help them with their healing process. I mentioned this in both the Gloriosa and the Shaki videos that I did where the three of them basically became the girl's parents. Rayleigh is, for all intents and purposes, the Boa sister's father. <laughs> he is the closest thing that they have ever had to a father and beyond Luffy and possibly Jinbei, he is the only one that Boa has not shown any form of <laughs> malicious intent toward that is a male. Um, she she allowed Law and Heart Pirates on the island because they were helping Luffy, and she seems to be somewhat okay with Jinbei, given the fact that he also helped Luffy. Um, but beyond Rayleigh and Luffy and Jinbei, she has no trust in men. And given everything that she went through with her and her sisters at Marie Joie is completely understandable. Plus, she also comes from an island that has nothing but women that was always against having men on the island to begin with. Um, and, you know, so Rayleigh and Gloriosa and Shaki help the three girls, help get them better. And eventually, um, I don't remember exactly how many years it is, but it's like a few years later is when the three sisters and Gloriosa end up returning to um, Amazon Lily. They make their way back to Amazon Lily. And the three sisters, probably with the help of the three adults, came up with the idea of like, okay, well, we need to have some form of a story to be able to tell them when we return to Amazon Lily for where we were. Because, and I'm pretty sure Rayleigh, Shockey, and Gloriosa were all in favor of the fact of like the girls were like, we cannot let them know that we became slaves, that we were captured and became slaves. The the our, our the, the rest of the Kuja can never find out about that. And that's where they come up with the story that the three sisters, that while they were gone, they battled against Medusa, the Gorgon, and they managed to slay her. But in the process, with Medusa's last breath, she cursed them and cursed her eyes onto their backs so that anyone who looks at their back will be turned to stone. And this is why, because the Kuja don't quite at that point in time understand how devil fruits work, because they seem very baffled by the way that Luffy is able to stretch and everything like that when he shows up. Really Gloriosa and Shocky would definitely know how devil fruits work at this point in time, given, you know, they traveled the seas and they have seen so much and they know how devil fruits work. I mean, you know, really was on, you know, or Jackson with Buggy. <laughs> um, so he knows how devil fruits work. Um, and all of that stuff. But um, the three sisters were like, okay, so this is the story we'll come up with. And that's why, you know, Boa is like, well, or Hancock is like, well, that's why I am able to turn people to stone is because of this power from the curse of the Gorgon. And, you know, you know, Sandersonia and Marigold are like, this is why we can turn into snakes because of this power. And the three of them, along with Gloriosa, return to the island and they are welcomed back. They tell the story, they explain it and everything. And what ends up happening is eventually, by the time when Boa is 18, it's either assumed that the previous empress either dies because of the lovesickness or that she um, retires or some variation or she leaves because of the lovesickness. We're not sure because I don't think we ever get the exact fate of Boa's predecessor. Um, but she is no longer empress. And Boa, or Hancock at that point in time, has proven that she is the strongest out of the Kuja. She is also the most beautiful because, of course, within the setup of the Kuja of Amazon Lily, beauty is str or strength is beauty. And the most beautiful is the one who is the strongest. And all three sisters have proven themselves to be very strong. But um, it is also implied that throughout their time at Marie Joie, that Hancock probably put herself 
in between her sisters and the guards and the Goro and the uh, um, uh, Tenryu Bito as many times as she could in order to protect her sisters because she was the eldest and it was her responsibility to take care of her sisters. Um, and that seems like something that Boa, well, that Hancock would do, where she would protect her sisters in that regard. Try to protect them as much as she could. And so that that's kind of always just been like my own head canon that she tried to protect them from as many of the horrors as she could whenever she was able to. Like she took punishment for them or she, you know, went in their stead depending on certain things as much as possible in order to protect them. It wouldn't have completely saved them, but it probably at least helped to a degree. And that's why her sisters will always defer to her because she is the strongest out of them. She has proven that she is mentally the strongest in that regard. Also, Boa is the first female that we see throughout the series that is able, that is uh, capable of doing all of, uh, using all three types of hockey. We see her use observation and armament and of course, Conqueror's Hockey. She is the first one that we are able to see that do that. Both Venerigold and Sandersonia have the other two types of hockey. They're the ones that end up kind of demonstrating that to Luffy when he ends up fighting them, but Hancock is the one that has all three. And as I've stated, Gloriosa probably has Conqueror's Hockey as well, and possibly Shocky does as well if they managed to prove themselves by raising all the way to the top of the Kuja hierarchy of the Amazon Lily, you know, you know, <laughs> um, hierarchy and everything. They may have it as well. And it might be something that gets revealed later on, but I wouldn't be surprised if they have it. Um, or they could not, and they just got that far through their own force of will, just not that, just not the Conqueror's Hockey version of it. Um, at 18, Hancock is made the Empress of the Kuja and the Captain of the Kuja Pirates. And she quickly gains this notorious reputation from a young age, which catches the attention of the Marines. The Marines then offer her, on behalf of the world government, um, a position among the warlords. And she accepts. And she is then, you know, she makes it like part of the treaty that she forms is like, okay, yes, but you guys are not allowed to come near my hometown, the our homeland. You're not allowed to come near Amazon Lily. And, you know... If you do, we will attack you. And of course, for the next however many years that was, I think it's like 10 years, um, 10 or 11 years that she's, you know, up until, you know, we get the start of the story, uh, that she and her crew continue to, you know, <laughs> terrorize Marines and pirates alike. Um, and then we get to where we actually, inter uh, where Luffy gets introduced into the mix. And of course, this is, you know, after the Straw Hats have been separated, Luffy gets sended, sending for uh, three to four days, you know, from Kuma's, you know, palm thrust, sending him flying, and he ends up landing on Amazon Lily, not knowing where he is. Uh, eventually, he ends up to the point where after he's run around, ends up crashing into the bath. Earlier that day, this is when we are actually fully introduced to Hancock. She is being um, talked to by Vice Admiral Momonga, and he is trying to convince her that she, along with the rest of the Seven Warlords, have been summoned to um, Marineford because of the execution of Portcus D. Ace. That she is to be there as a representative to be able to help the world government to help the Marines should the Whitebeard Pirates show up and attack. And Hancock has no interest in going. We get this whole introduction of the, the speech that she gives about kicking kittens and ripping off ears. And you'll still forgive me because I am beautiful and everything. And, you know, we see her activate her devil fruit power and she launches it at them. And everybody on the ship except Momonga gets turned to stone because Momonga stabbed himself in the hand. Um, at the last second, so that way he would think about pain and not love or attraction or anything like that. And, which is, I think, just one of the things that's, you know, has solidified Momonga. is like, yeah, he's good. He's proved himself to a degree. He at least has some form of a brain. <sighs> Doesn't he? Doesn't Momonga have a brain? She's like, I don't know what a Momonga is. My pretty girl. 
My pretty girl. My pretty girl. And, um, my pretty girl. Are you a pretty girl? And what ends up happening is, of course, Hancock has now turned all of his men to stone, so he's not going anywhere. She goes back to the island. We get the whole entrance where she shows up, and she's just, you know, her and her sisters and the rest of the Kuja that were on the ship are, like, welcomed back, like, conquering heroes returning from a war. And, you know, you know, everyone's just so happy to see them and everything like that. And we see how, you know, much she's adored by her people and everything. And what ends up happening is, you know, they head into the castle or the palace on, you know, Amazon Lily, which I really like the design of Amazon Lily. I think it looks really freaking cool. Um, I think Oda did a great job in designing it. Um, and, you know, she goes to the castle and we have these little interactions. I don't know if some of these were added in in the anime, but they definitely add to Boa's character because there's a moment where she is um you know where she is shown um the statue that was made for her of her by like the children of the of you know by the little girls of amazon lily that just adore her and she looks at the statue and then she just like smashes it because she's like that is an insult to my beauty and i'm like it was a gift for you from children you <laughs> word B word. And, you know, so there's that. <laughs> that happens. And then this is also when she gets into the argument with Gloriosa. And Gloriosa and her are arguing over the fact that Gloriosa is like, you need to go to this thing. You need to go to this execution on, you know, with, you know, for, for Ace, B, for Porcus the Ace, because you need to keep the protection of the world government over Amazon Lily because you've seen what happens in the past. You know, there's been times in the past where we have been attacked and you need to do something to be able to protect us. And that's what your job is. And Hancock is literally just like like a, a spoiled teenage girl to their parents of like, I don't want to. I don't find it entertaining. Why would I want to go to this thing? I don't want to. Again and again and again. And she's like, but I, it does not matter what, it does not matter if I do not wish to do it because I am beautiful. And then she ends up like, throwing Gloriosa out the window and then she looks back at all the people that are there that just literally watched her throw this old woman out the window and she's like aww and they're just like aww and it's just like oh good lord hi it's like yep you're beautiful I would like to hope I would be somewhat immune to that but I have no idea um <laughs> I've never been in the room with anyone that that was exceedingly beautiful as the way that Hancock is designed to be. She's like, why is there a shade here? It must be up. And what ends up happening is, of course, Boa then is, or Hancock is like, I wish to take a bath. And this, of course, makes everybody flee the palace because she's going to be bathing and that means she's going to be naked and for them they think that means that the, 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 got, the eyes of the gorgon are going to be on display and from there i have a brenda that needs petting and from there you know so all of them scurry out this is where we get like the backstory of like oh this is you know the the kuja sister or the, the the gorgon sisters and their backstory with killing the gorgon and everything like that is told to one of the little girls and then during this time frame luffy is running around the island and he eventually ends up crashing through the top of the castle right where the bathroom is is where he falls in and he falls into the bath where Boa is, where Hancock is, naked. He looks her over. He realizes she is naked, but he really has no reaction to it. He sees the thing on her back, which we do not see what the thing on her back is yet, I don't believe. And he sees that, and he seems to somewhat recognize it. And, of course, this makes her panic. At this point in time, her sisters run into the bath because they hear her scream. They realize that Luffy has seen her back. So their whole thought is like, okay, he has to die. And 
she ends up releasing her Maromarino beam on Luffy. Luffy, I think, makes a you know mistook it for like Foxy's beam and didn't think it did anything. And Hancock and her sisters are just bewildered by the fact that Luffy is not being affected by her by the power. Why is he not stone? He should be stone. He saw the most beautiful woman in the world naked in a bath. Why is he not stone? And eventually this results in Luffy being captured and thrown into the combat arena. While in the combat combat arena, he ends up fighting against um, the Bakura, who is uh, one is either Marigold or Sandersonia's uh, giant jaguar thing that they have, and he beats it with a single punch. But during this time frame also is when uh, Marigold, Sweet Pea, and Afalandra are brought forward and they are explained to be the ones that found Luffy and then Marigold kind of, and then uh, Margaret actually kind of helped protect Luffy at one point. And the three of them end up getting turned to stone as punishment by Hancock. And then throughout the other fights, because Luffy ends up then having a fight where he fights against Marigold and Sandersonia and Akanda, that was what Marigold has. Um, and what ends up happening is, or that's what um, Sandersonia has, I believe, is that one. And what ends up happening is, you know, while Luffy is fighting with them, Hancock is watching all of this happen because, of course, you know, he has invaded her island. This is a man who has invaded her island and has not been affected by her devil fruit power, hasn't been affected by her beauty, and she is very, very annoyed by this. And... You know, she watches the fight between Luffy and her sisters, and then at one point when Mar when uh, Margaret is about to be shattered, Luffy's Conqueror's Hockey activates. Not for the first time, but it really starts to awaken at that point in time, and it's because he's protecting someone who helped him. And it unleashes his power, and Hancock and... Marigold and Sandersonia, along with the rest of the, you know, a bunch of the other Kuja are all fainting at that point in time. And the three sisters and Gloriosa are very much realizing exactly what this is that he has, because they've all probably been experienced to it because of Hancock, because Hancock probably had to do a lot of practicing with her um, Conqueror's Hockey to get it to her strength. I don't think we've ever actually seen Hancock show her Conqueror's Hockey to its full strength at this point in time. Um, I, I think we've seen her demonstrate it to a degree at some point, but I don't really know if we're ever going to get a full-on demonstration of like her hockey, her Conqueror's Hockey versus someone else's Conqueror's Hockey. I would like that if we did, um, if we got that at some point in time. But, you know, this makes them not destroy... Margaret and then Luffy moves the three statues of his friends which he knows are them he saw them get turned to stone he moves them away so they are in a safe spot and Hancock is like fine we will not harm them and then we get the whole rest of the battle that happens between Luffy and the other two sisters and eventually what ends up happening is Sandersonia ends up hanging over the pit and her outfit is being burned off Luffy because he had heard them mention something about we can't have anyone see our backs, has jumped on top of her, stretched himself out, and is covering her back while she hangs over the pit. And the others are like, oh no, he's attacking her. But Boa, but Hancock and Marigold, along with Gloriosa, figured out what he's doing. He is covering, you know, Sandersonia's back so it's not revealed to the world. And he covers it out of sympathy. And this, you know, Hancock then tells everyone to leave the arena and they all leave. They, you know, he, you know, they get Sandersonia moved back into the, you know, back onto the arena stage and get her shrunk back down. And they get her, her back covered up and everything. And Hancock decides to give Luffy an ultimatum. And she's like, okay, either you will have a choice because you saved my sister's uh, my sister from revealing what was on her back. I will give you an option. You can either A, um, I will give you a ship and I will allow you to leave our waters safely and everything so you can go and find your friends. 
or I will turn these three, you know, Margaret, Sweet Pea, and Alphalandra, back to normal and they will no longer be stone. She thinks, of course, that, oh, like any guy, he's going to pick the boat and just go. Luffy, because he's Luffy, is like, no, turn them back to normal. Make them, make them, you know, alive again. Fix them. <sighs> Which befuddles Hancock, but she, she agrees. She turns, you know, you know, fixes the other three. And through that action, this starts to show her, you know, Luffy's true nature and everything. And this, of course, leads to where Hancock and, you know, her sisters and Gloriosa are in Hancock's room and Hancock reveals to Luffy her back. And she's like, you said you thought you recognized this symbol. And he's like, I thought I did, but what I saw was something else that was on one of my friends. He's talking about the, the sun pirate mark that's on Hachi. Um, and she's like, well, this mark that is on me is the hoof of the dragon from the celestial dragons. It is a mark that is put on those who were slaves. Your friend may have been a slave, or at the very least, he may have been associated with slaves at one point, and he has that mark as a way of trying to cover it up or in solidarity with them. And this is where we get the reveal that Hancock and her sister, where Hancock is revealing to Luffy about their past, about them being slaves at Marie Joie and everything that they went through. And I believe this is also when Gloriosa tells um, tells the three sisters that Luffy punched um, Charlos in the face, punched a celestial dragon in the face, not, you know, less than a week ago and everything like that. And they're like, oh my god, which then just adheres him to them even more. And, you know, you know, via those interactions and everything is when Hancock starts to develop the love sickness. And why do you push my chair? She's like, I don't know. It was there. It was in my way. It needed to be pushed. Is that what it is? Did it need to be pushed? Silly baby girl. I love you. And what ends up happening is, of course, you know, Boa gets the love sickness, and Gloriosa is explaining it to her that this is a love sickness. This is what your predecessor had. Other predecessors have had it. I've had it. The only way to deal with it is to actually, so you don't die of the love sickness, is to actually, like, not deny your feelings for the person that you have them for. And, of course, that's for Luffy. And Hancock gets to the point where she is just 100% smitten with Luffy, and she agrees that she will help Luffy get to Ace. And this, of course, leads to Luffy and Hancock, you know, making their way on the Kucha pirate ship, where she kicks a kitten and a seal out of her way before she gets on it um, in front of everyone. And then she just goes, I am beautiful. And they instantly forgive her. <sighs> the kitten and the seal did nothing to you, woman. Um, it's like... <sighs> As I said, her arrogance and her beauty is what she uses to wear as an armor to hide what she's actually gone through. Marigold and Sandersonia have both done something similar. Marigold has gone through and tried to make herself as strong as possible with going into her sumo style and everything like that. And was focusing probably a bit more on armament hockey. And Sandersonia has gone through so much in order to try... Has gone through so much to work on having her observation hockey be rather high spec. I think it would be interesting to find out if Mary, if Sander Sonia would ever be able to push herself to have observation hockey like future sight observation hockey like what Katakuri had or like what Katakuri has and what Luffy has. That would be interesting if she would push herself that far. Would she be able to do that? Um, possibility, but I'm not sure. And eventually, you know, Luffy and Hancock with Luffy, you know, and, you know, in disguise underneath, you know, Hancock's cloak and everything, make their way back to the, sh make their way to the Marine ship. She, you know, unfreezes every, unparalyzes, petrifies everybody on the ship, and then they make their way to Impel Down. While there, Luffy just gobbles up so much food and everything, and then eventually when they are taken to, when they get to Impel Down, she helps Luffy get into an Impel Down, and then Hancock goes all the way down to where Ace's cell is, along with Hannibal and Domino and I think Magellan is there or Magellan and her whichever ones make their way down to where Ace's 
um, Cell is. Um, at some point in time when, you know, when uh, Luffy has, you know, called her by her real name where he calls her Hancock. And I have someone who wants pets. Where, he, you know, he actually calls her Hancock instead of Hammock or whatever else he's, you know, called her over the, you know, time frame that he's been talking with her. Um, for names that sound like her name but are not her name. She thinks that means I love you. And she keeps misunderstanding that which is adorable but very much Hancock and very much where she goes into like the schoolgirl type crush on like oh my god he said my name type of thing you know just like hallucinations um this part of Hancock's personality that comes out in that regard is something that I do find adorable I do I do find that adorable um, and she, of course, makes her way down to Ace's cell where she, she's Ace and she ends up um, being able to deliver the message that Luffy is on his way to try to rescue him. And, you know, during this whole time, Luffy is doing the breakout and eventually, you know, Hancock leaves Impel down and she is taken to Marine Ford where she is, you know, where she ends up meeting with Doflamingo and Moria and Mihawk and Kuma and, you know, the other warlords that are there at the time. Um, and where, you know, they work on their battle plan for what's going to happen. Hi. Yeah, I know. You're a good baby. Mommy is still talking about the snake princess. She's like, why? I'm right here. Yeah, I know. Um, she does this while I'm working too, where she's just like, you will pet me now. Yeah, I know. Um, and then, of course, is when the actual, you know, when Marine Ford starts, where the actual battle happens. Hi, yes, I know. Uh, where the actual battle starts happening, where the Whitebeard Pirates show up, and they have to deal with Little Oars Jr., and they have to, you know, deal with all of that, and all of Whitebeard's allies and everything showing up, and we get all of these fights, and everything that happens there and eventually what ends up happening is of course Luffy and you know the ones from Impel Down show up the the ones who escaped from Impel Down show up and once they show up Hancock starts um you know she starts trying to do what she can to try to get to Luffy to try to help Luffy she ends up actually stealing um the key that is to Ace's cuffs so that way she can give it to Luffy and she ends up at one point actually ends up attacking Smoker who is trying to attack Luffy and she protects Luffy we also get various moments of course through this where we have Boa's arrogant moments where she is you know laughing and laughing and looking down on someone so far she's doing the looking up and pointing at everything and everything and she, you know, she protects Luffy from Smoker and everything. And um, she gives Luffy the key so Luffy can try to make his way to Ace and everything. And Mr. Three ends up making a copy of the key so that way they can save Ace and blah, 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 blah. And Hancock watches all of this. And she ends up, unfortunately, um, during this time frame, at one point in time, I think someone tries to attack Garp, and this is after the announcement has been made that Garp is Luffy's grandfather, and she tries to protect Garp, which is kind of adorable in that regard. She's like, oh, she will not attack my grandfather, and all the braids are like, the parents are like, wait, what? <laughs> um, which is just also funny, because it's like, okay, um, Garp had tried to quote-unquote chase Shocky around, um, <laughs> when she was a pirate and there's the joke about Gart being Hancock's grandfather which I'm like that would not happen but that was funny um I like that joke that's a good joke and what ends up happening is um you know at one point in time you know she watches as Luffy is able to get Ace out of the handcuffs and she's like really rooting for him and really hoping that it works and then of course she watches as everything happens and there's a moment where she actually um jumps between luffy and a pacifista that like scans her under those like boa hancock is you know do not target is you know do not shoot is ally type of a thing and she protects luffy at that point in time i don't remember exactly when that is but i know that when she watches as um Luffy when as Ace dies in Luffy's arms 
that she watches that and she's devastated by that as well because she knows how much she would go through in order to protect her own sisters and what she probably went through a good chunk of the time at Marie Joie in order to protect them. And so she tries to protect Luffy in that point in time. And I think part of that is what allows um, Jimbe and Buggy to be able to get Luffy and then get him to um, Law and the submarine and the polar tang and get them out of there. And she, along with, um, uh, she ends up commandeering, I think, a marine vessel. I don't remember, but um, something happens and she ends up coming across um, Trafalgar and the polar tang and everything and tells them, okay, here's what you need to do. Come to this island and that's where they follow. And, you know, Law and the others go to the, go to Amazon Lily and um, she ends up, you know, she allows them on the island within a very small slice of the island along the coast. She allows the heart pirates there so that way Law can treat Luffy. And what ends up happening is, of course, after Law has treated Luffy and Luffy is awake, um, during that time frame, Hancock was like, oh, I need to make food for Luffy and everything like that. And um, eventually, of course, this is when Luffy is running around the island and smashing stuff and where Jimbe is trying to stop him. And the fact that she allows Jimbe further into the island, I think she might know about Jimbe's connection to Fisher Tiger, possibly. Um, which is a nice little connection there that they draw that she's like, okay, this is a man that was deemed okay by Fisher Tiger. And he was the one who freed us. So... I will allow him on the island more, a little more rain on the island. And she, of course, allows for the Amazons, for Afalandra and such to go and feed the um, heart pirates while they are there. Um, and um, they end up, you know, getting Luffy, you know, Luffy is taken care of and everything. And then, you know, the heart pirates leave. And when Luffy, you know, is finally awake and you know calmed down by Jim Bay and everything like that. Um, Hancock had spent like those two weeks very very worried about Luffy and I think so were Sandersonia and Marigold because they kind of experienced some of what happened there where they you know where Luffy has shown that he does care about them and they probably heard from Hancock what Luffy went through to try to protect his brother and of course failed unfortunately and, you know, the rest of the Kuja probably heard bits of it because the rest of the Kuja really end up liking Luffy, of course, um, in the long run. After they're fascinated by the fact that he's stretchy, which is hilarious. Um, but what ends up happening is, of course, this is when Rayleigh ends up showing up. And Rayleigh, um, of course, you know, interacts with, you know, Gloriosa and Sandersonia and Marigold and eventually... Hancock realizes that he's there and she's like, hi, none of this food is for you. It's all for Luffy. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> it's like the daughter, it's like he shows up at the house and like two of his daughters are fine talking with him. His, I guess, I guess Grand Neon would be somewhat of like a mother-in-law to him or something like that. Um, cause she probably would have been the closest thing to a mother that Shocky possibly had. But then there's like, okay, Gloriosa and Sanderson, or like Sandersonia and Marigold and Gloriosa are all happy to see Rayleigh. And then <laughs> Boa's or Hancock is just like, hi dad, I made dinner. None of it's for you. It's all for my boyfriend. Um, <laughs> that's like what happened there is like that comparison. And Rayleigh comes up with the idea of like, okay, I'm going to train him for two years, blah, 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 blah. Everything happens with them going to Marineford again and ringing the ox bell and they go to Ruskina then. Once they are on Ruskina, uh, Bo actually, or Hancock actually ends up getting very angry at um, Rayleigh because she's like, oh, you're not going to let me see Luffy while he's training? How dare you? And she get angry at him like a girl yelling at her dad like why won't you let me see my boyfriend it's like why can't i come to football practice and watch him um it's like vibes that that gives off um <laughs> which is just funny and Rayleigh's just like he needs to focus on training and eventually boa or hancock relent relents and everything and you know then you know luffy and Han luffy and Rayleigh are on ruskino for the next two years um, and then there's during the time skip, I know it's non-canon, but they do have the 3D to Y um, uh, OVA movie that they made that I actually like and I actually think does a good variation of showing 
how Luffy would have progressed in his, you know, training and everything like that. So I do like that. And it does center a lot around Hancock and her relationship with her sisters and everything like that. And, like, it shows Luffy with how he's dealing with losing Ace and everything like that. So I do like that. And I have seen it. And I do think it's a good variation of um, kind of showing, like, what would have happened during that time frame. So we have that. Um, also, it just shows some more of, like, what Hancock is capable of with, you know, her training and everything with her own power. And then we cut to after the two-year time skip where we have Return to Sab Odi, where, of course, um, Hancock and her sisters and Gloriosa and, Mar and uh, Margaret are the ones that show up on the island to get Luffy and to take him all the way to um, uh, Saba Odi. And, you know, while they're there, Hancock has been asking Luffy multiple times to marry her. You know, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Will you marry me? And he goes like, no, Hancock, I'm not going to marry you, but thank you for the food and for the cape. You know, for the cloak and everything like that. And she gives him a disguise to help him with trying to get through you know, trying to get through Saba Odi without being recognized. And I think they turn some people to stone during the time frame when Luffy and the others are trying to escape. I think, maybe, I don't remember. But she's like, you know, is happy with Luffy when he's able to escape and everything. Yeah, she stalls the Marines for a little while. And Sanji is just mem mesmerized by her beauty. Oh, Sanji, I'm sorry. Um... <laughs> And of course, then we have like a few other little check-ins with her. We have during the, uh, at the end of Whole Cake Island, when we have the, um, 500 million berry man arc, you know, little cover story there where it's, you know, all around the world where everybody's learning about that. And Hancock, of course, has this giant version of Luffy's bounty poster printed and put up on the castle wall, which is funny. And then we have some stuff that happens during Wano that is non-canon, but I'm just going to go over it because it is kind of fun. Um, we have, like, the Cider Guild arc, which ties into, um, Stampede, which are, like, I think, like, two episodes in the anime that are just filler that are there to show Luffy interacting with, you know, Hancock and Gloriosa and Sandersonia and working with them to fight against this little Cider Guild and everything, and that's how he finds out about the invitation to Stampede to, um, the, the invitation to Stampede, the invitation to the big pirate festival. And everything and of course that leads into the stampede movie and i really like hancock's uh, outfit throughout the course of the stampede movie most of her outfits i actually really like i think they're really nicely done outfits and the fact that well some of them are much more you know dramatic up front she also has ones that are more on the conservative side of things like the outfit that she wears during the battle of marine Corps. that's like the purple dress um, that one I really like too, because she is able to fight in it, and we do see her demonstrate her powers in it, um, with her kicks and everything like that, with, like, perfume femur and perfume arrows and stuff like that, where she's able to, you know, attack the marines and turn them to stone, or attack pirates and turn them to stone, or kick pacifistas and partly petrify them and everything. Um, so we do get, like, shows of her power, and throughout the Cider Arc one, and throughout 3D2Y, we get other instances where we see her power. And then, of course, during Stampede, we get good examples of, like, her power level there. Where she, like, gets angry because um, Bullet attacked Luffy. And she just, like, gets so freaking angry about that. That she just, like, I don't remember. I think that's her perfume femur attack or something like that. Where she just, like, you attacked my husband, though, and you are going to pay for it. And she just, like full speed runs at bullet in his like giant kaiju form and just like powers up all of her hockey and she probably used some form of like you know um <laughs> you know conquers hockey coding at that point and just bah, smashes in to bullet and like actually causes some damage to things so we get that and of course there's all the other bits where she's running around and talking with Luffy and helping fight against him along with Sabo and Crocodile and Law and everything and all of that. And she's there when Luffy gets his hands on, um, the ever, the, um, what was it, the, the eternal pose to Laugh Tale. And she's like, with, with that, you could find it in an instant. Crush. <laughs> you know. And we get all of that, and we see all of that with Hancock, and yes, I know that it's non-canon, but again, those moments do show very much her power level. And so, showing their power level, I think, is canon, but overall, like, the events that surround it are not canon. Like, 
like Uta is canon in One Piece, getting a film right into him. Uta is canon in One Piece. She existed. She is Shanks' daughter. But to the extent of how far she is canon when it comes to her relationship with Luffy and whether or not she's still alive is a different story. That type of a thing. You get what I mean. And then going on to Film Red. Um, while Hancock and her sisters do not appear throughout the whole story of Film Red during like the end credit bits, we see Gloriosa singing one of Uta's songs and the, the Hancock and the other two are like in the background watching her. And then we get back into canon events where we have at the end of Wano, at the end of Wano arc and into what would be the Egghead arc, we have it where we finally get the flashback as to what happened on Amazon Lily. And it is revealed that after the Warlord system was abolished, which we have the moment where um, during one of the act breaks in Wano where the Warlord system is abolished, we have it that, um, you know, the Marines are on their way to capture each of the Warlords and Hancock is kind of the one giving the speech about like, they forget why we were made warlords in the first place. It is because we are strong. And we see her and the Kuja and her sisters all getting ready for this fight. And it was Yamakaji and Kobe that were sent to deal with Hancock. During this time frame is, of course, when Blackbeard shows up. And he ends up capturing Hancock. She's turned a bunch of his men, including Devon and um, Vasco. Yeah, Vasco turns them into stone. And he has her pinned, you know, lifting her up. And there was this, um, and I'll get to this uh, observation that I saw someone make in a moment, but, um, you know, he is, you know, pinning her and, you know, nullifying her ability at that point in time. And during that time frame, what happens is, of course, she explains that, like, even if you kill me, it won't reverse what happened with the people that I petrified. And even if you give my devil fruit to someone else, they can't reverse the petrification. So he can't kill her because it would completely ruin his plans if he kills her while his people, while his men are still, you know, petrified. Um, during this time frame, Kobe is there, he pleads and he ends up, um, you know, and this is when Rayleigh and Shockey show up and they kind of scare off, uh, you know, Blackbeard enough, but Blackbeard, of course, takes Kobe hostage and he leaves. And um, then we get to where we have a few weeks later, we see Hancock, Shockey, Rayleigh, her sisters, and Gloriosa are all there um, kind of like finally being able to breathe a little bit after what happened with the Marines and with Blackbeard showing up. And... What ends up happening is we actually see Hancock on her knees with her head in Rayleigh's lap. And he seems to be kind of trying to comfort her. And this is where we get the reveal that Shockey was a former empress and everything like that. And they're like, thank you for showing up and thank you for helping us. Also during this time frame is when we, you know, during the time frame for the flashbacks and stuff is when we get the first reveal of the Seraphim. And I think one of the first ones that we do see is a snake. And of course... Um, as Snake is, of course, Boa's clone, or is, of course, Hancock's clone, and it has the powers of, and she has the powers of the Marimaranomi, same thing as what Hancock has. Um, I have had so many people, or I have seen a lot of people say that the way that they got Hancock's DNA was during when she was a slave at Marie Joie, but I'm like, okay, I highly doubt they're taking blood samples from every single slave that was ever at Marie Joie, considering the fact that the world that the celestial dragons really have much no much interest in them beyond having them be servants and slaves and entertainment purposes. So I don't see why they would be wanting to have their genetics on file. Even if they did feed them a devil fruit, what is the point of having their genetics on file? So I don't think that's where they got Hancock's um, DNA from, her lineage factor. What I think what happened was when she became a warlord, either there is a blood test that they have to do, and that's why they have her genetics, or it was she was some other point in time when she was at Marine Ford for the battle and everything like that. There may have been something where they got some of her genetics at some point in time. I'm sure someone would have gotten the ability to get a hold of her saliva or hair sample or something that they could use to have her lineage factor on file. And then, you know, Vegapunk and the satellites would have been able to use that to make the Seraphim, to make a snake. That's my thought on the matter. 
Um, but because if they did take, you know, if they did take, um, DNA from every single slave, then they would have koala's DNA and they would have Fisher Tiger's DNA and they would have so many other, you know, people's DNA, you know, their lineage factors that were slaves. And considering so many of them were just bought on a whim and they weren't like strong people to begin with necessarily, I don't see it being that they would have kept their genetics on file in that regard. But I could be wrong. And if that's revealed that I'm wrong, then I'm wrong, but whatever. But the thing that I wanted to point out that I saw someone else point out was that when Hancock is sitting on the beach with Rayleigh and, you know, the rest of what is essentially her family, she is sitting there on the ground with, you know, on her knees with her head on Rayleigh's lap and he seems to be calming her or like, you know, comforting her. You know, it's like, we'll, we'll do what we can to keep your island safe and everything like that. And that is one of the very few times where we have seen that Boa is not, that Hancock is not looking down on everyone. There are so many times throughout the course of the series, the manga, the anime, even in the movies, canon or not, where she is always looking down on people, either looking down directly or looking up, you know, looking so far down on them, she's looking, you know, up. That even when it came to dealing with Blackbeard, it was the same thing when it comes to dealing with Marines, when it was at Marine Ford, when it was dealing with, you know, Hannibal, and when it was dealing with um, Magellan and all this other stuff, it was always her looking down on them. Luffy was one of the few people that she did not seem to do that to. Same thing with Jinbei to a degree. While she would get arrogant with Jinbei to a degree, it wasn't as bad as she did with other people. And then even at this point in time with Rayleigh, she would have to look up to speak with him. And the fact that this is, for all intents and purposes, really is the closest thing to a father that she and her sisters have. For all intents and purposes, he is her father. Um, it's just, that is, that is what it is. He is her father. And her sisters would probably agree with that. It doesn't mean that they're ever going to call him dad or call him father or anything like that, but he is essentially their father. And he is one of the very few the very, very small handful of men that the three of them are actually comfortable enough around to not have to have their, their, their armor on the entire time. Yes, Hancock will bring out her armor to a degree when it comes to dealing with Rayleigh, but at this moment, she has let that armor fall. She does not have her arrogance up, and she does not have her using her beauty as a way to deal with what's going on. She is just in that moment, a little girl who has gone through hell and back multiple times. And she is sitting there with her father and he is trying to comfort her while her mother in the form of Shaki slash Gloriosa are off to the side. And while her sisters are over there as well. I don't know if we see Salome in that regard, but he would also, Salome male or female, I don't remember, but we get all of that. And that is something I wanted to point out is that Hancock is one of these people that has gone through hell and back multiple times from everything that she went through at Marie Joie and everything. That, you know, I understand where her arrogance is coming from. And I understand that she uses her arrogance and her beauty as an armor to protect her and her sisters and her people and the other people that she cares about, you know, Luffy, Shocky, Rayleigh, Gloriosa, as much as she may rail against them, because it's like, as much as a child, a teenager may rail against their parents, you know, a rebellious teenager may rail against their parents, they, you know, Hancock still knows that Gloriosa loves her like a daughter, loves her and her sisters like daughters. Shocky and Rayleigh are the same way, that they love the three Boa sisters as their own children and all of that. So that's what I have. I thank you for watching. I hope this is a bit more of a clarification as to how I picture Hancock throughout the course of the series. As I stated, it's not that I don't like her. She's just not anywhere near my favorite female character or my favorite character in One Piece in general. So that's what I have. I thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you have a nice rest of your day. Bye.